Hey, hey, welcome to another edition of Keep Calm and Carry. This is episode 30, and thank you so much for joining me tonight. I've got a really special guest, uh, a gentleman that I met at NRAM back in May, and uh, have really enjoyed uh, sharing some content uh, ideas back and forth with him. And uh, he's really been helping out the channel on occasion, giving me some really good ideas on uh, a number of different uh, training technic uh, techniques and stuff like that. So uh, we'll get into all of that a little bit later. But uh, first, naturally, thanks, guys. Thanks for swinging by. I sure do appreciate you guys spending your Monday evening, especially when the 9-1 Chiefs are playing the 9-1 LA Rams. I am not watching that game because I would be a nervous wreck right now uh, watching my Chiefs beat up the Rams. Uh, last check, they were ahead by one. So keep on keeping on, boys. Let's uh, pull off a win. That would be huge. So real quick, if you guys haven't seen, I've got a couple of different things going on. I am just cranking out the content right now. You guys have my newest vlog that dropped yesterday. Today, I dropped a video about uh, Black Friday sales, and that's going to be a couple different videos throughout this week, talking to you about all the different sales that are, are out there, like... Um, Today was with Rainier Arms, and then I hope to have a video tomorrow on either Palmetto State Armory or Brownells, and then we'll have one from Olight. Olight has a pretty cool sale that's going to uh, kick off on Thursday. So, um, yeah, stay tuned for all of that, and hopefully I can save you guys money. And actually, you guys know this. Uh, they're mostly affiliate links, so if you purchase something, um, not only am I always trying to save you guys money, but you're also... Uh, doting to the channel as well because I will get a small commission from that. Always want to be transparent with you guys to make sure you know exactly uh, what my aims are. And um, I sure do appreciate all the support, man. You guys have no idea how awesome it is for you to go through fit and fire, order something, get a small kickback from it. And uh, that keeps uh, basically my ammunition supply uh, in the green as I do all of my reviews and such. So thank you so much. I do appreciate that. So I have one thing I really wanted to jump into real quick before we get into anything else, and that is November's Tac Pack. It was airdropped yesterday. Uh, it came from my crappy uh, mail lady. Um, I, I, I say that because I was forced to place numbers on my mailbox when uh, all they have to do is just look just, they just have to turn their head. All you got to do is just turn your head and my and my my house numbers on on the front of my house. So I guess this is more difficult than this. So take it for leave it. So anyway, it's right here. I'm a kid on uh, Christmas Day. Whenever I get a box in the mail, so it's already opened. And um, sorry but not sorry. So here's the card right here. And this is actually a pretty cool box. I'm really excited about this uh, because it's got some uh, cool little things and then some pretty cool, awesome, big things as well. So uh, first and foremost, right out of the box is going to be this, um, pull two things out, this mag light, this little tiny mag light, you can throw it onto your keychains. Uh, pretty cool. Um, not the brightest one in the world. It's only 47 lumens, but uh, it is bright enough, I guess. Uh, something that you can put right onto your keychain. And um, yeah, takes a little AAA battery, no problem. Right there, that's pretty cool. This is actually the really cool thing because I'm using a clevis pen for this when building an AR-15. No, I don't need to because I've got this guy right here from Real Avid. This is their um, AR-15 pivot pin tool and it's so freaking awesome you guys can see it right there that's the instructions and it just attaches to your front and you can plop it in and do a little tw twisty thing and then you push the thing in and, and it's done it's just like that <laughs> let me tell you this has like literally saved my marriage on uh, well the clevis pin anyway the clevis pin hack has literally saved my marriage on several different occasions because i end up throwing things when i get frustrated and this will do the exact same thing so save your marriage and get one of these if you can. <laughs> so that was pretty awesome. The, uh, let's see, the next thing is, it's all right, it's pretty cool. Uh, tack Pack, it's, it, winter is coming. If you guys watch um, uh, Game of Thrones, you know what I'm talking about. So you get a little beanie from Tack, tack Pack, uh, which is pretty cool because uh, it gets cold here. So there's that right on over all over the place we're just going to toss it around and then the last thing this is actually the coolest part of it all this is the je machine sop mod stock 
boom, right there. This is going to look really good on my Aero Precision M4E1. So I'm gonna swap out the Magpul and I'm gonna put this on here. About the only thing um, I would say about this stock is I can tell it's, it's heavier. It's a little heavier than your Magpul, but JE Machine is also who uh, contributed to TACPAC last month with their AR-15 Armors tool. So that's pretty cool. And um, yeah, always good to have stuff for AR builds. And there it is right there. No TACPAC. I'm just going to toss it right because today has been a rough day. Today has been a rough day. I, um, I'll tell you about that here in just a second. But first... Take a little sip of water. Let's get over to the chat room to say hey to everybody because we've got Nico already dropping in $2 on the Super Chat saying, headed back to work, you damn day workers. Yes. Sorry, Nico. Um, daytime's where it's at. Um, I, I understand that you are part vampire, and that's okay. So let's see. Let's get into it. DeGrim Reaper first. Operator Tony is second. Special K is third. Third, thanks for swinging by, guys. Uh, Mystery Family, Andrew Dalton Ray, Gun Loving Grandpa Stanley. Hey, thanks for swinging by, Grandpa. Appreciate that. Uh, Ghost Tactical, good to see you in the chat room. And I've uh, been checking out some of your chats. Good, good jobs over there. Good jobs over there. Um, Big Man Kevo is in there. David Bowling, Gregory, thank you. Zach Berg, and let's see, scrolling down, scrolling down, Scott P79. Thanks for swinging by, guys. If you would, hit that thumbs up button. If you wouldn't mind, that helps out with all the algorithms. So, had a pretty bad Monday because today at lunchtime, I decided mm, I'm going to skip lunch and I'm going to go out to uh, my hunting area and uh, check to make sure that my blind is still up because next week starts Kansas' firearm season for deer. And um, surprised, over the weekend, we had a lot of wind and my my blind, my pop-up blind was still standing. Uh, and that was pretty cool. So by the time I got out there, I was like, hmm, that's pretty cool. And then I walked right around it because right next to my blind, literally, like I could reach out the blind window and touch the tree that's sitting next to it, was where my um, trail camera uh, was sitting. And turns out that someone decided that they needed my trail camera more than I did. So my camera, I guess, either was swiped or grew legs and walked away. So uh, pretty frustrated about that. That really, really stank. So what really bothers me too is about 500 yards to the east of where my blind is, is a brand new blind. Um, this area that I hunt, no one has ever really bugged me. And um, now people are moving in and uh, really stinks. So Oh, well, public land hunting, that's what it's all about here in, uh, in Kansas. So anyway, Sam's dropping in. Hey, how you doing? Thanks for swinging by. And I sure do appreciate it. So let's get into this week's Keep Calm and Carry. I've got Mike from Munitions, Weapons, Tactical, or uh, MW Tactical. He's also the co-host of Black Man with a Gun a podcast, that is. And uh, I have had the honor and privilege to meet him at NRAM, uh, along with, uh, I believe if I remember correctly, let's see, we ended up talking for, mm, man, a good 30 to 45 minutes at the Brownells Cigar and Guns gathering after the Friday night, um, get, uh, you know, the Friday night deal that they had on, um, I think it was Friday night, maybe Saturday night. Days all combined anyway, but uh, Brownells had a little get together at a cigar bar and uh, Mike and I sat around and chatted for good 30 to 45 minutes just about uh, content and so on and so forth. And I really did like that connected with them. Both of us are army veterans, which is pretty cool. And we'll get into that here in just a second. So without further ado, let's introduce Mike from Mission Weapons Tactical Munition, Munitions. I can't even, I mess it up every single time and I'm sorry about that, but <laughs> Munitions Weapons Tactical, MW Tactical. How's it going, Mike? Thanks for joining us. Tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, and what is Munitions Weapons Tactical? Hey, I do appreciate that, and um, thank you for having me on to your show this evening. Um, to go ahead and tell you a little bit about myself, as you already stated, I'm retired military. Uh, right after high school, went straight into the military, so that's the only job I officially ever owned. Um, outside of that, um, about 
what was that, like 15, 16 years in, something like that, I was stationed at Fort Benning. And the job I held at Fort Benning, we had so much downtime. A group of us had got together and we was going to either start a business or go to school. So we all said we wanted to start a business. And we had it all planned out what we was going to do, you know, shooting, combatives, and medical. But everybody was all engaged into it, throwing ideas. But when it was time to collect the money, nobody wanted to come forth. So I was like, okay, I'm going to do it. Put together a website, called it M-W Tactical. Um, first, it didn't have no name, but everybody just associated it with Michael Woodland. And I was like, no, it's not Michael Woodland. Um, so I just came up with the words munitions and weapons and just ran with it. Right on, right on. That's pretty awesome. Uh, you know, when I was trying to create my own YouTube channel, that was probably one of the best, well, creates a brand, I guess, not necessarily a YouTube channel, but the brand itself. I struggled for a very long time to figure out something like that. And it, if it wasn't for my the creative genius of uh, one of my good friends, my one of my best friends, uh, I would have struggled for a very long time on trigger, trying to figure out some type of brand name. And so uh, that's pretty cool. Um, you said that you said that was at Fort Benning, is that right? Or did you say Fort Campbell? No, Fort Benning. Fort Benning, okay, all right. Um, <laughs> there's a there's a group on um, on Instagram that I follow, and it's all about uh, airborne guys. And uh, heaven forbid that you would say anything positive about the 101st, because they'll just crush you in a second. Uh, because I guess that's not the real airborne. I don't know. A little off, but whatever. <laughs> so, um, tell us about you know this is. Keep calm and carry. We're always concerned about um, the state of the Second Amendment. Um, you know, we don't necessarily ha always have to get into politics or anything like that. But uh, tell us a little bit about your your background as far as um, carrying, conceal carry. Do you conceal carry? Um, kind of, if you do, what what is kind of your normal EDC? And what your loadout kit is? Okay. Yes, I I do conceal carry. Um, Right now, I carry the Smith & Wesson M&P first generation, but I'm um, slowly but surely transitioning all my firearms over to a different brand. So right now I'm going with um, competition shooting. I shoot a Walther Q5 match. And um, here in the next few weeks, about a month or two, I'm looking to possibly get in a PPQ and kind of have that be my um, everyday carry. Awesome. Um, so I'm a Glock guy uh, or a SIG guy is what I normally carry. So Glock 19 uh, right now. And then um, let's see, do I even have it? Where is it? Uh, yeah. So you guys have always seen it. There it is right there. There's my Glock 19 that's Gucci'd out. And then I've got uh, my pig, my pig, <laughs> uh, my SIG. P365 is what I normally carry. Uh, and that's done me very, very well. But the Walther PPQ, uh, hear nothing but great things about it. And i um, really interested to try one out, to just get it uh, a couple hundred rounds through it. Have you shot one before? Um, actually, the Q5 was the first Walther firearm I ever shot. Mm. So, um, I never shot anything else from Walther other than the Q5. Um, this weekend, this was my second time shooting that firearm in a competition match. Very nice, very nice. Uh, so Andrew drops in here real quick with a question and says, uh, and I, I, I'd be interested to see what your take is on it. Who bets any amount of money that the Smith & Wesson M&P will kill the Glock market? What do you think? You think it'll, it'll uh, disrupt or kill the Glock market? Yes, honestly, yes. Um, only reason I say that is, is that when um, Glock actually came out with their polymer and uh, steel platform, Smith the Wesson took it and made it better. You know, so the Glock did have a better advertising program. But overall, like, you know, um, have you held the M2.0 yet? Yes, yes, I have uh, the M2, uh, it's the M&P 2.0 compact with the four-inch barrel. Okay, so like um, when I first um, held it, you know, the texture automatically caught my attention. 
that aggressive grip, the stippling. Mm. You know I would. I was worried about that as as aggressive as that stippling grip texture, whatever you want to call it, was. Um, I was really concerned that that was just going to destroy my my baby hands. Um, and <laughs> uh, and it, surprisingly enough, at the range, it didn't even bother me one bit. Um, but I will say that carrying it um, was a little uncomfortable. So most of the guys that I've talked to said just take some take some uh, sandpaper and lightly sand it down and and you're good to go. Yeah, I never carried one. Like I said, I just held one. I haven't even shot one yet. So, um, but right now, like I said, my focus is Walther right now. So, um, TKD, Ty Kithy, Kithy. I hope I'm pronouncing all of that right, but uh, he dropped in on Super Chat for three ninety nine, saying, Happy Thanksgiving. Hope you have a good season. Thank you so much, uh, and happy Thanksgiving, not only to you, but to everybody as well. Um, I will have a, a video pop out on Thursday just to say thank you to everybody, because I can tell you, you guys will hear it first. You guys that are in the chat room are uh, my diehards and I, I absolutely am thankful, thankful for each and every single one of you. So, I uh, appreciate you, um, <laughs> dealing with me week after week. And, uh, I sure do appreciate everybody's support. It's really, really awesome. Bryce wants to know, uh, or he makes a comment rather on the Smith and Wesson. He says, never the Glock platform is way better. And the MMP lacks size in the hand. And most people prefer a grip that feels the hand and I would somewhat disagree because I think some of the back straps on the uh, M&P uh, eliminates that. What do, you, what do you think there? Do you, do you agree on that there, Mike? That's true. Um, like right now, if I was to go to my safe, I actually got three full size m ps and each one I got a different back strap on it. You know. That actually is a good point. I've got I've got one here in my safe. Let me see if I can crack it open. Hold on a second. Mm -hmm. Did you take notice of how he Try opened the door? Here, knocking all over my freaking. There we go. When the door opens, it stops so you can't see the arm. Awesome. Okay, sorry about that, guys. Um, so this is the Smith and Wesson M and P nine Core Pro Series. So um, if you can see, this back strap right here uh, is actually swells around the uh the grip itself now i'm a glock guy i love glocks but i do like how this this uh back strap kind of puffs out a little bit and feels your hand a little bit better if, if this one feels better in the hand than this one right paul harrell so that's one of the things that i really like about it now one of the things that i don't like about the smith and wessons and uh you guys see this is clear clear now this is a pro series right so it's been through and it's got the upgraded trigger so you can see the take up on this and there's a little it's weird because it stops and then it's there's this big sponge right there before he hits the wall and then break and then your reset there and break again so uh pretty decent still uh just a little hang up uh but i will say the regular mnp nines uh that, that hinge trigger that they have i'm not a big fan uh, have you been able to adapt to that mike at all well um i carry my um smith and Wesson right up for maybe two two and a half years before i sent it off to get some custom work done to it so um i sent it up to atei up in michigan and they did uh, 1200 dollars worth of work to it came back upgraded trigger you know lightning you know, a reinforced spring that allowed me to do what plus P plus. So um, overall, like I said, um, that's what I did for two of the Smith and Wessons minus the one. You know, so what about um, what about the VP9? Have you had a chance to shoot that one? No, I haven't shot the VP9. 
Okay. So one of the things that I do really like about the VP9 when it comes to filling your hand, as uh, Bryce was saying, uh, is that you have uh, small, medium, and large back straps and side plates. So that if I remember correctly, and if I do my math right, there's like 27 different combinations that you can uh, adapt your pistol grip to fit your hand exactly how you want it. And that was a really big plus with it. The only thing that I was kind of iffy about when I first started shooting it is the bore axis sits a lot higher than your Glock or your MNPs. And that was something I had to get used to. But whatever magic uh, that the VP9 was made with, uh, the, the sights are dead on right out of the box. It was really, it was this pretty small, smooth shooter. So uh, if you guys are H and K fans, or as someone pointed out that I shouldn't say H and K, I should just say HK, even though it's hecklering and cope, but whatever. <laughs> um, comment section just goes wild sometimes. But anyway, um, yeah, I, 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 if you get an opportunity to maybe even rent one from one of your local ranges, I, I'd, I'd say give it a go. I think you might like it. So yeah. let's see here. Um, a lot of people, I'll tell you what, a lot of people talking about the Glock 45, which is uh, 9mm. <laughs> but uh that is um it's, it's interesting what is your take uh, and i'm, I'm kind of getting off script here but what is your take with the glock 19x and the glock 45 i don't know if you had a chance to hold one or shoot one but what's your thoughts on the shorter frame with the or excuse me the shorter slide with the longer frame um to give you more purchase for your hand is that is that something that fits in your mindset? Not necessarily because um, pretty much when you hold something, it's either you like it or you don't like it because you can make it work for you. So for instance, um, like I got an M&P shield. It's a thinner frame gun, even though I got larger hands, but I can make it work. I just have to alter the way I shoot it. You know, So it's going to be a little bit uncomfortable for me, but the end result is I'm going to hit target you know so i'm not a big fan of glock because the only time i really i shot a couple of my friends glocks but um the one time i really shot a glock and it meant anything was when i shot for the shoots and snare you know mm -hmm. when i was stationed over in germany yeah you know but i was surprised that the german army wasn't using hk because it's a german weapon also mm -hmm. you know but um we shot the glock then I was impressed by it. Um, it's a great shooting uh, firearm, but for whatever reason, you know, just holding it too long in the angle, it's, it really started irritating my wrist a little bit. You yeah, know. yeah. <laughs> not, not to walk into any jokes, but. but yeah, well, yeah, but I, I can see what you're saying because it, it does give you a little bit more, you would think that it would dampen down the, the muzzle flip a little bit and it does a little, it does somewhat, but it depends from person to person. So I'm just, I'm laughing at the, the uh, comment section here because they're going off on the, the uh, Glock's nomenclature for their models. Cause they're talking about how they're waiting for the Glock 1911 to come out in 32 millimeter or the Glock 556 to come out in 6.5 Creedmoor. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's, these guys are out of control, out of control. I just wanted to say hi real quick to uh, some new people that jumped in on the chat. I sure do appreciate it. Now, interesting enough, uh, this gentleman here, Hachi Ruku Performance Group, uh, he, he, he found the channel here recently. He's a new guy. I sure do appreciate him stopping by the, the, <laughs> the live chat. But his first video that he watched was my um, three reasons why I hate the Taurus G2C, the, the the video that I'm getting my butt kicked on right now. And I'm pretty sure if I look at the analytics right now, I have more down thumbs down than I do thumbs up. <laughs> I got 24,000 views on it. Uh, it's it's pretty crazy. He said that was his first video and he still subscribed. So thanks. Hey, thanks a lot for that one. <laughs> Not my best performance. Uh, and then uh, the Millspec guy, he jumped in. He makes a comment here talking about the back straps and everything. And he loves how all these different pistol manufacturers are coming out with different back strap sizes, but pretty much everybody uses the mediums that are already pre-installed. <laughs> so <laughs> it's pretty, it's pretty funny. So you guys, you guys keep cracking me up. Uh, if you have any questions, by all means, drop those in there. Um, Keith wants to know if there's going to be a Glock revolver. 
You know, stranger things have happened because Kimber has come out with a revolver. So who knows? We'll see. And oh, that's a new thing too. Kimber is coming out with a single stack striker fired pistol that will probably be unleashed at SHOT Show. So I will bring you guys some video of that one when, when I get there next here just a little bit two months about two months so let's get back to the chat uh mike you are the co-host of black man with a gun uh podcast tell me about that what do you guys focus in on talking about or what things do you talk about i guess to share with the group on that podcast well um pretty much it's, it's just like any other podcast anything that goes on it's just the name catches people's attention black man with a gun you know what I'm saying? So anytime you say that, it's going to pull people's attention now. Um, at the same time, we talk about various topics, whatever's going on in the community. Uh, we give tips. Um, it's just an, an enlightenment show. So if you haven't listened to it, please go check it out. Just go to any one of the podcast platforms and put in Black Man with a Gun. And like I said, if you're, I'm pretty sure you're going to like it. You're going to love it because, like I said, we talk about a little bit of everything. You know, it's a very positive show. That's pretty awesome. Uh, what is some of the, uh, what are some of your favorite tips to talk about uh, or to share on your podcast? Um, one thing I do like to talk about is anything related to new shooters, right? So, of course, you know, um, anything concerning how to purchase a firearm, grips, um, sight picture, breathing, stance, you know, just keep it basic. You know, it's no reason to talk about Hey, you got to run from here to the Walmart and hang a left and hit target and make sure ain't nobody shooting up the place. You, you got to do all that. Keep it simple, right? Bring people into it and then let their interests guide them to where they want to go into the shooting community. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, what would you say? <clears throat> and I know this is kind of um, situational or person dependent, but, uh, do you, do you recommend for people to start shooting with a 22 long rifle pistol or do you, are you more of a, let's jump in with both feet, go in with a nine or a 380 or, or maybe even a 40. What's your take on what caliber for new shooters to start with? Now, I'm not a big caliber person for new shooters because honestly, when you think about it, when people join the military, a lot of times that's their first time shooting a rifle. They didn't shoot a 22, so same thing with a handgun. You know, go ahead, jump into it. If you want to shoot or not, shoot or not. My first handgun I purchased was a 40, you know, but then I transitioned to a non only because I thought it was more cost effective, you know. So more than likely, like I said, hey, you're getting into firearms, hey, just go ahead and go for what you know, but at the same time, listen to recommendations. But I'm not a big believer in like, okay, if you're new, start off with a 22 and let's graduate on up. Now, if you're a child, you know, for your children, of course, um, when you're teaching them, start them off with the 22s so they can understand the concept and the little bit of recoil that will set forth for a child. Mm, very much so. Yep. So I, I've started my daughter off. Well, both of my, my kids were start off with uh, 22 long rifle rifles. Uh, and then my son really didn't get into uh, the pistol game until um, eh, 17. I had him do a uh, IDPA match just for fun and he had a great time. So uh, that, that was, that was uh, pretty cool. So you, you've mentioned that uh, you're, you're getting more and more into competition shoots. Um, tell us a little bit more about what you've been doing with your competition shooting. And do you think that that type of um, those type of competitions shoots that you do does that translate into any type of real world training at all would you say yes it does all right so to answer your question is backward um yes it does because of the fact all right so if you go to a shooting class and you take that shooting class once you leave that shooting class you're probably going to retain information from that class for maybe 10 days after that it's going to be gone it's just like when you go to the gym and work out Whatever muscle gain you have, it's only going to be with you for 10 days. So if you go to a competition shoot and you start doing a competition shoot, now it's going to reinforce you to remember, you know, like, yo, concentrate on your breathing. Oh, let me focus more on my trigger pull. Maybe my sight picture and sight alignment. That's why I'm having all these misses, you know. <laughs> so um, overall, when you break it down, 
competition shooting, it does help out for real world situations because it's building that muscle memory, as people like to say. As far as me in the competition world, um, when I first, well, I was stationed at Fort Benning and I took this course with ICE. They had some extra seats, so they let, let us come in and um, do the course. And the instructor, he used shooting as a platform to get your understanding, you know, to capture your attention. And since then, I've been bit by the bug. And I was doing it heavy at one point in time. And then when I um, left Fort Benning and went to Louisiana to now, it was kind of difficult to do all that transition and, and traveling and keeping up because, you know, purchasing am ammunition and all. So now I'm at a point where as I can just dive back into it, set myself some goals. So right now in USPSA, I'm rated as a C-class shooter. I haven't shot in over a year and a half, two years time frame. So this time next year, my plan is to either be an A-class shooter or a master. Very nice, very nice. I know that um, I haven't been uh, very active in IDPA shooting this year. Uh, I've been focused on a lot of other things. I've got a couple of matches in, but uh, I was able to go through um, qualification. I'm a marksman, no big deal. Uh, I'm I'm just short of becoming a um, sharp shooter, but um, I just I, I've been concentrating on so many other different things. So. Um, it, it's it's a uh, it's definitely a commitment. If you want to get good at it, you have to not only practice, but you also have to get to a lot of different events uh, as well. So I, I did see someone pop uh, in here that said that um, IDPA will get you killed, and um, I don't necessarily disagree uh, with that statement because number one, uh, if you carry every single day and uh, you are using the IDPA or USPSA mindset of, you know, shoot, 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 uh, swap out your magazine, shoot, 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 and, and, you're, and you're playing the game and you're never using it as a real world training exercise, uh, then yeah, I, I would say that yes, uh, shooting competitions could possibly get you killed. However, if you're getting training and uh, you're using these shooting competitions to reinforce that training that you've already got, um, then I, I, I would say that's where I would disagree with that statement that uh, you're just reinforcing the good training that you already have. So um, that's kind of my take on it. That's kind of uh, something I picked up from my conversations with James Yeager. And um, yeah, I, what, what do you think, Mike? Uh, do you think that uh, getting deeper and deeper into shooting competitions could um, harm your training that you've already had? No, I don't think it'll harm anything. Like, like you said, I believe it will honestly help you out. So like one scenario I can give you is this. Say for instance, you go into an establishment and somebody starts shooting up the place, right? If you went to training six, seven months ago and probably went to the range once or twice a month in that time frame, now you're gonna freeze. Just like when you dive into water, like you know how you get that little shock moment, you're going to freeze before you react versus as if you do competition all the time and that same situation, you're going to be more fluid and you're going to think a lot more clear and then you're going to perform. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's, that's kind of my, my stance on it too. Ghost Tactical, uh, Ghost Tactical jumping in there saying that he's going to be training with Jaeger here in a couple of weeks uh, and he's looking forward to it. You are going to have a blast. Uh, I, I really hope that uh, you get a chance to spend a lot of time with James while you're there because uh, that <laughs> – that dude cracks me up uh, day in and day out. And then his his instructors that he's got, those guys are uh, uh, a lot of fun to train with. Alaskan Blissics jumping in there, chiming in about my vlogs that I've been doing. I've started um, a uh, low, I would say low sugar diet, not no sugar because I can't get away from it. I have a slight issue with sugar. <laughs> so he says no sugar and then goes on to say, hashtag guard every school, hashtag protect every child. Absolutely great campaign that Alaskan, Alaskan Ballistics is uh, putting together. So um, I apologize, guys. I'm going to have to take a take a step away just a second to go shut my door because my, my, my dog pushed it open. <laughs> I didn't realize it wasn't latched. So I've got some noise coming in from uh, the living room. One second. 
Well, until he returns, I can't say for him having a sugar issue, one thing he probably could do is eat more fruit and that will cut down on always wanting to eat the sugar. Yeah. So, um, so I don't know if you know, Mike, uh, I know some of the people in the, um, uh, in the chat room, uh, have been watching the vlogs. I, I have a really bad time with sugar. Uh, I'm trying to substitute substitute things. Someone suggested that I get a whole bunch of smoked salmon, and when I get cravings for sugar, just go ahead and uh, have a couple slices of the smoked salmon uh, to help diminish that craving uh, and fill me up. I told him that if I did that, I would have mercury poison poisoning in like two days. <laughs> so, when I was um, back when I was younger, like when I first went into um, Iraq the first time and the second time, I think it was the second time. Everybody used to always send me gummies because you know that's my favorite candy. But then again, it's like I said, I would always get a sugar rush, and then before I knew it, I knew I had to cut back on it. So one thing I started doing was forcing myself to eat more fruit. And that helped me out tremendously. So whenever I had that sugar rush, I would just eat fruit and it cut down and um, changed up my diet. And like I said, after a while, before you know it, you start eating healthy and start feeling better. Right on. So I got a score update here from big man, Kevo84. Uh, Thank you so much for not only the score update for the $1.99 um, super chat, uh, 30 to 30 with seven Oh nine left in the third quarter. Go chefs. You guys need this win. You really need this win because of, uh, the, um, the tough game you had with the Patriots. So, um, thanks for that. Uh, <laughs> and yeah, one of the biggest problems that I've had Mike here is the, uh, Halloween candy that's been sitting around everywhere. I've done really good so far starting this week off, right? Not, eating any of that candy. And then uh, last week I had no candy whatsoever, but I did, I did have some desserts uh, last week, um, which I did have a choice to not eat, but you know, you put a piece of cheesecake in front of me, especially when it comes from one of the places here in town that makes really good cheesesteaks. It's hard to turn it down. You know, <laughs> um, Don't feel bad about that. Um, I've been on this kick here for the past month or two, whereas I'll, bake a cake and like i said i'll eat it like in three or four days i turn around and bake another one <laughs> yeah right on right on uh i had a couple people jump in here uh that i saw so i wanted to say hi to those people brenda osborne thanks for swinging by i appreciate it sean reed uh and yeah that's uh yeah those come some of the new people that jumped in so uh getting back to our our, uh, our chat here, you know, you, you mentioned that um, you are a veteran and l let me ask you, you know, you're, you're retired. You spent, was it 20 or 24 years? I, I, I don't recall. Uh, 22. 22. Yeah. So we'll split the difference, right? <laughs> so uh, thank you so much for your service. Thank you for uh, spending 22 years of your life, uh, you know, naturally writing that blank check as a lot of us, um, not only myself, I'm also a, uh, a military spouse, and then I've got several people here in uh, the chat room who are veterans themselves. So thank you so much for your service. But tell me, when you transitioned out, um, did, what, what was some of the things that you really came to miss about leaving military? And then what would you say have been some of the things that you've been able to take away from the military and, and use that in your civilian life? Well, when I first left the military, it was very difficult because you got to remember from the age of 18, 19 years old, that was my everyday life, right? So that's all I know for 20 some odd years. Um, it has never hit me like how you always hear people saying, but when they got out of the military, they woke up and thought they was running late for PT. That never hit me. So um, luckily, you know, I just get up when I want to get up. Um, I set my own schedule and majority of the time it's either spending time with my daughter or um, making phone calls, whether it be the ghost tactical to you <laughs> or, you know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm always doing something engaging. And, um, but I fulfill it, you know, shooting on the range. So by me going to the range, that opens up that memory, you know, faucet of, my military life. 
very much so. Um, that, that's I, I don't know about you. Um, when I go to the Zen, when I go to the the range, <laughs> I have kind of a Zen moment. Uh, that is the couple of hours of Zen time that I have, which seems really kind of weird. Uh, I'm fortunate enough to have a range that it's pretty much available to me when I need it. And I'm typically the only person there. So I can be my myself. I can do whatever I want. I can concentrate on uh, shooting and filming what I need to film, concentrate on fundamentals and whatever other harebrained things I come up with while I'm there. Uh, would, would you agree? Is that, is that the same thing that you find? Yeah. When I go to the range, um, it actually calms me down, you know, so stress-free, you know, very much fun. Um, just like you, um, I have a range here in South Carolina that I go to and I have the liberty to pretty much do what I want to do minus certain rules that they enforce on everyone. But one thing that I want to do is I want to do a tour and go to different places where people who I met, like yourself, Ghost Tactical, um, Clover Tech, go to those different locations and shoot video and just have fun. You know what I'm saying? Shooting guns, you know, and possibly training or, you know, if you're into jujitsu, let's go do jujitsu and then hit the ranch, you know? That, that, that is uh, something that I've, um, I've had a lot of fun with. It's, it's fairly new. I've been around martial arts uh, when I was younger, got away from it. When I went into the military, you know, we had hand to hand combat and then it switched into the combatives program, which was a lot of fun. I enjoyed that because it brought me back to my days in um, high school when I wrestled, which was um, a lot of fun up until I broke my nose. But um, <laughs> uh, since then getting into jujitsu has been a lot of fun. The, the trainer that I work with is it's, it's real casual. We really don't, we don't do belts or anything. He's just there to teach, uh, teach me what I, what I want to know. And um, right now I'm working on arm bars. That's the, that's the thing that really I struggle on uh, is, is making sure that I, you know, get my hips shifted correctly to get my uh, leverage prepared or get my body prepared for the leverage to get my legs up and, and pull that arm bar down. So um, what, what is, uh, when it comes to Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, um, what has been some of the favorite, your most favorite things about it? Um, well, you got to remember I'm six foot five. So one of my favorite moves to get anybody in is a triangle choke. Mm. You know, so it's pretty much easy for me to pull off an arm bar or the triangle choke, depending on the angle that I'm in or the position I try to roll somebody over just because I'm longer, <laughs> you know? Now, if I go against somebody just as long as me, now it's, it's gonna be a fight because it's difficult to fight somebody as long as me, you know, if that makes sense to you. Yeah. Uh, so it breaks it down to more technique. Yeah. You know, you know. Yeah. Us, us short people, we really struggle. Uh, even, even with me um, kind of sparring with uh, my instructor, uh, Cole, he's, mm, I would say he's about an inch taller than me, but he's so skinny that um, he, he's a, a, he's a, he's a built skinny. Uh, he comes in, I think, probably about 160 but it's i'm pretty sure he's sitting about five percent body fat um and <laughs> trying to roll with him is very difficult because he's able to um get the leverage on me every single time it's been so difficult to to do anything against him yeah i got a purple belt at my gym this guy is about five four five five and maybe weigh 125 and I outweigh him easily by 150, 160 pounds, you know, but at the same time, I never made him tap, but he made me tap every time. Mm. All yeah. about tech. Yeah. All about it. Really is, really is. Uh, Special K asks, gi or no gi on Brazilian Jiu Jitsu? Um, for me, uh, Mondays, Wednesday and Friday is gi. Tuesdays and um, Thursdays is no, no gi. That's how we train it at my gym. Um, I really have no preference in which one I like better. 
because you know it kind of the rules kind of change. So if you go to a competition um, for no gi, you can do it with no shirt on, and that was harder to grip and do anything else. But if you do it with gi, you can use everything except the belt as a weapon to your advantage. Yep. Yep. Um, Absolutely. Um, let's see. Hachi Roku Performance Group asks, uh, "What's Mike's channel name? I've got it down in the description uh, below. So if you guys just uh, scroll down underneath the video um, in the description of the live chat, you will have his YouTube channel. So um, swing on by over there. I will add his uh, Instagram and you, you're on Facebook as well. Is that correct? Yeah. To put it easy, um, if you can go to Facebook, Instagram and um, YouTube, just search for M-W Tactical. There you go. So that makes it easy for everybody. So I did have someone else pop in. Let's see. Uh, Andrew was asking, what is your favorite military sidearm from 1986 through 2008? Not, uh, that, to be honest with you, that's kind of a, a small window of time. But uh, uh, do you have a favorite military um, sidearm? that uh you wish you would have had if you were in the military um if we can open it up to just firearms it would be an easier question because <laughs> um between that time frame when i was in i think the beretta was the main firearm to sidearm that they was carrying in every unit that i went to and it was more like the rangers and special operations had the you know the good stuff so, um, but if we can open it up to any firearm, I would actually say either the 60 or the 240 Bravo, um, only because I actually carried that when I first joined and I had a lot of great experiences with it. But if I can actually get my hands on one of those old school Berettas, I will probably actually do a lot of training with that because the, the rule was back then, if you can shoot good with that old school Beretta, you can master any other handgun you touch. Yep, I'd, I'd completely agree with that. <laughs> I pull from California to Virginia. <laughs> I, I personally can't stand the Beretta 92F, uh, and that that's because uh, the uh, sample size of one that I had that I carried for an entire year in Iraq uh, was nothing but a dusk magnet. Uh, it, it, it turned into a, 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 a particle trough with that open slide design and then uh, trigger string trigger spring broke on me so uh, I could pull the trigger and it would fire but every time I got done with it I'd have to put my finger behind the trigger, flip it forward to be able to pull uh, the trigger again. And that was uh, pretty awful. And I've made that comment before and they said, well, that's, that's not your, that's not the pistol's fault. That's the armor's inability to maintain it and service it and stuff like that. And I'm like, yeah, maybe, but at the same time I'm in war and uh, supply doesn't necessarily get to you when it, when you need it the most. So, you know, I, I just, I don't like the design of it. I think that um, there are far better, pistols um if i could use any sidearm from the military from that time frame uh i would probably um i'd probably go with the uh sig p226 uh that uh that was a pretty that's been a pretty decent gun a lot of people like it a lot of sf groups have been using it as well so update on the rams uh chiefs game rams are up 33 30 I'll tell you what that's a shootout right there so not going to watch it <laughs> <laughs> so um so you brought up the you brought up the uh m60 or the m240 uh did you spend any time with the saw yes um so the only reason why i say the 60 and the 240 is um you know in the states if you was in an infantry squad and you carried that um it was more like an endearment you're the man you know so this is a reward for you but if you get overseas like korea you know or any place that has a mountain that's more of a punishment and i was one of those privates that was very mouthy and always getting in trouble because of my mouth so i got hit off with the 60 you know so um and i had a, gr a lot of great learning lessons from that experience that still sticks to me 
to this day. So that's why the um, 60 and the 240 actually resonates with me pretty good. Uh, when I came back to the States, um, then I got introduced to the saw. Because it's like you graduate 60, saw, M4, and then you're squad leader, platoon sergeant, and all that good stuff. Right on. Um, I can completely empathize with your statement of you know being in Korea and the 240 being a punishment. Uh, I, I went through PLDC at uh, Camp Jackson in Korea, and um, you know I thought I was going to be you know Mr. S you know super cool guy. I volunteered to to carry the M240. Um, mainly because I was about the only person there that knew how to operate it, knew how to function check it, disassemble it, all that stuff, because I was on tanks. So I had to maintain two of, two of them. Um, but then we started going up and down the freaking mountains uh, there. And in <laughs> half a day, I was done. I was so done with that thing. That was punishment. <laughs> oh, yeah. So just imagine um, your team that has to carry – the tripod and extra ammo and you know you're carrying part of that along with this you know and then you're pulling heels so it was always horrible but like i said it was a lot of great learning lessons yeah that. great yeah it really is um andrew he he says uh, here what's interesting is most military veteran veterans hate or hated the military M9, but loved the civilian M9. And the reason for that is because uh, most people who had a Beretta 92F ended up being a safe queen or something that they uh, only took to the range very, uh, very seldomly. Not too many people really take those out and carry them on a day-to-day -day basis. So they are very, very tight. Um, they're, they're not as jiggly and wobbly as your military M9s that you get from any standard uh, unit's arms room. Uh, those things have been well worn in, and um, they end up being extremely uh, clanky and bulky, and, and just they just they it feels like they're just going to fall apart in your hand any, at any second. Uh, but interesting enough... Um, my wife is out at Fort Riley, and um, they her unit is uh, is already got the new M17, uh, which is the Sig P320. So um, that was pretty interesting. Ironically, though, uh, she just qualified with her pistol and still was shooting a Breda M9. So I don't I don't get it. <laughs> Um, did, do you have any thoughts on the military, the army anyway, going to the M17? Um, I've always said they needed to upgrade their handguns. So whatever they went with, anything was better than what they had with the Berettas because a lot of those Berettas were from um, like the Vietnam era. So anything was way better than what they had on hand. So and it didn't matter if it was a Glock, SIG, nothing less it didn't matter just give them something that's more updated in the soldier's hand and they can get effective with it so special k he uh retracted his comment but i saw it before you retracted it yeah <laughs> you, you go ahead and hang out in osan all you want there guy yeah that's okay we'll be we'll be the tip of the spear you can just sit back and hang out in your chair force yeah whatever come at me with that stuff <laughs> Anyway, all right. So we're we're getting ready to approach an hour here, uh, Mike. I sure do appreciate you swinging by. Last question that I have for you is: What parting wisdom would you like to pass on to the average uh, Joe or Jill American uh, regarding you know your your just you know your love for the Second Amendment, uh, your your uh, any type of training advice or anything that you you feel is like the most important thing that you have to get out and share with somebody, what, what would that be? Just slow down, breathe, and enjoy life. There it is. There it is. That's yeah, it is. Isn't it? Man, that, that that's actually some really good advice because um, – you know, I was talking earlier that I went out to check on my uh, my my deer blind, and uh, someone had swiped my trail camera, and I just sit there and looked at that tree for about a minute straight, just just boiling inside that somebody would be so inconsiderate uh, to to my stuff. You know, what's what's ironic is that they would 
steal my camera, but my blind cost three times more than my camera did. And they left the blind and then I had a deer stand like uh, 50 yards away and they left it sitting there too. Uh, I just, I don't get that, but it's great advice. I had to slow down. I had to breathe and I just had to sit there and think, you know what? Still got my spot. Still going to be here come next week. And um, there's nothing on that camera that was going to tell me anything that I didn't already know. So great advice. That is really, really great advice. So um, it, before we get out of here, did you have anything that you wanted to pass on to the chat room or to myself? Any questions that you uh, wanted to present or? or? Well, first of all, I want to apologize for um, not being my upper chipperty, always joking self because I'm extra tired right now because I've been under range all day and I was editing videos after the range and then forcing myself to stay awake so I could make this interview. So, um, <laughs> but if anybody would like to follow me, like I said, please go to Facebook and Instagram and look up M-W Tactical. Um, you can find that same search under YouTube, Gunstreamer, and OogeTube if you like the video content. If that's too much. Just go to m-wtactical.com and click on media links, and that will take you to everything I do social media-wise. Um, if you are one who likes to watch videos and product reviews or just interviews, I put out a video every Tuesday um, morning or afternoon, um, so you can just subscribe to the channel, and when it uploads, you'll get it. Outstanding. Yes. Uh, please do swing by his channel and check things out. Also, uh, again, check out the, uh, the podcast black man with a gun, uh, that, you know, that's one that's going to be added to my list. I, I admittedly, I haven't been listening to it, but, uh, I have been waiting patiently for <laughs> the team over at, uh, semi arm life to drop their episode 10. They're running through a number of um, technical difficulties. So in the meantime, Black Man with a Gun will be the next one that I'll be listening to while I'm waiting for semi arm Life to uh, get uh, their next episode out and rolling. So thank you so much, Mike, uh, for spending the night. I, too, am not as chipper as I normally am. Uh, I'm a bit tired today. I didn't I didn't stay on uh, track with my, um, with my eating schedule, so I didn't eat basically from, oh, about 8.30 this morning until about 2 o'clock in the afternoon. So I was um, I was pretty edgy, and uh, then I went and worked out, and I'm just drained right now. So, uh, And with the score being what it is on the Chiefs game, I think uh, last I saw it was someone popped in there and said, yep, 40 to 30 Rams uh, beating up the Chiefs. So, oh, well, uh, hopefully they can – must or come back. We'll see. But uh, thank you so much, everybody in the chat room. I sure do appreciate your guys's um, interest and your comments and everything else. Uh, Big Al, you crack me up with your your new nomenclatures for the different Glocks that are coming out. <laughs> Mike, thank you so much for swinging by. I sure do appreciate it. Head on over, support Mike and everything that he's doing. I've learned a whole bunch from him and sure do appreciate him spending this evening with me. And we will catch you guys later. Thank you so much. And as always, keep calm and carry. See you later, guys. Good night.